So now I want to turn to what we call the Keynes model. This is, um, of course, just one version of the sort of macroeconomic stories you can find in Keynes, one, one version of what Keynes is saying about how the economy works. There are many, many different interpretations of what Keynes was saying, and I don't think there is any correct interpretation because uh, Keynes, perhaps even more than most um, thinkers, was someone who was very um, attuned to the political uh, situation that he was writing in and to the audience he was speaking to, and therefore adjusted what he was saying frequently in response to the, 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 the context and the audience. And even within the general theory, I think you can find a number of different strands of argument directed at different targets and, and directed at different sets of questions. And of course, the general theory was only one of many things that Keynes wrote, although it was obviously his most influential book, but he was a very prolific writer who took many different lines of argument um, in different settings. So this is one, this is not the definitive story of what Keynes said, but it is one interpretation and, and it, one that is both relatively simple, not simple, but relatively simple, uh, one that is, is quite influential in terms of the, the sort of subsequent evolution of Keynesian economics, and one that I do think captures a lot of the important pieces of what, what Keynes brought to the macroeconomic conversation. But as I say, there are many different interpretations out there. There are many different Keynesians. So just a very quick sort of survey of different things that people have taken out of Keynes. Some people have emphasized the principle of effective demand, that the quantity of spending in the economy determines the quantity of production. And this, this includes, among other things, sort of an emphasis of direct links between quantities, income, consumption, investment being directly linked to each other as opposed to being their relationships being mediated by price changes. And for some people, this then puts the sort of why, okay, why aren't prices working at the center of the Keynesian story? And you get stories about price stickiness or wage stickiness, which other people say are not actually important parts of uh, Keynes's theory at all. Um, other people emphasize that this is not a story about equilibrium. This is a story about a sort of economic process happening. It's a story about a situation where people are not getting the outcomes they expected and are sort of adjusting their behavior in response to that. So this, this is something you know, that was really uh, developed, emphasized by Axel Le Lyon Ufid, um, really, uh, I think really important thinker about, about Keynes and about economics who, you know, that was sort of his, his, his Keynes is a, is a thinker about disequilibrium and relatedly not quite the same. John Robinson really wants to emphasize Keynes is talking about, you know, the development of the economy in historical time as opposed to a sort of notional point of equilibrium that, that you can eventually arrive at. Um, other people really emphasize the sort of production side. If, if, you know, if you ask Keynes, you know, what is the difference between your economics and, you know, the other economics? One, one expression that he used was that he was um, telling a story about a system of monetary production as opposed to real exchange. So some people then emphasize the production piece of this. This is a story about, not about there's, a, there's an endowment of stuff that's gonna be exchanged, but there's a social process of production. And you know we could sort of point to Schraffa as being kind of one of the most important thinkers in that strand of the Keynesian tradition, if you wanna call Schraffa part of the Keynesian tradition. Um, then there's the people who emphasize that what Keynes is really doing is focusing on the distinct problems created by the existence of long-lived capital goods and the fact that you've got this investment process. Um, uh, you know, so maybe we would put Minsky over here who talks about, you know, the, the, the real problem is that um, you have a price for current output, but you also have a price for existing assets and existing capital goods, and those are not necessarily going to move together. And then the other problem with investment also is in general, it has to be financed. You make some sort of monetary commitment when you undertake an investment decision that you hope will be justified by the returns that investment will generate, but you don't know when you make it. So other people you know, related to that emphasize the uncertainty of the future as being the real distinctive um, contribution of, of Keynes. Paul Davidson, the founder and longtime editor of the Journal of Post-Keynesian Economics, really always, his, his Keynes really starts with uncertainty. And you can find that in a lot of, especially the sort of American branch of post-Keynesian economics. And of course, then related to that is, is seeing liquidity preferences a really central part of the Keynesian story in the sense that liquidity, the search for liquidity is motivated by uncertainty about the future. Other people, you know, Jim Crotty particularly, but not only him, 
you know, take that line, uh, this sort of a throwaway line in the general theory about his, about support for the, or the, the need for a more or less comprehensive socialization of investment and, and say, this is not just a, just a casual line. This is actually a central theme of, of Keynes's writing. And um, so that's where you get, you know, Crotty's account in um, Keynes against capitalism is that actually this, this whole argument is really building up to an argument for why we, we have to socialize investment. For other people, the really critical piece is, is the money. If we say it's a system of monetary production, not real exchange, then you put the emphasis on the monetary piece of that. And just as one, one example of many people you could put in that box would be Perry Merling, where the, the sort of the key Keynesian insights come from taking a balance sheet view of the economy. This also raises sort of profound issues of measurement. If what we really see is money, what are these real objects like the capital stock or output that we think it's describing if, if money is more fundamental? And, you know, of course, you can find support for this, this for in, in Keynes as well. Um, uh, you know, Keynes did not in general have much time for Marx or much interest in Marx, but there's, there's one point where he says, you know, there's one very important thing that Marx was right about, which is that the ultimate goal of the entrepreneur, which is what Keynes always called the capitalist, is not commodities, goods for their own use, but simply more money. So what Marx understood that, that many other economists have not is that we don't live in a world where people use money incidentally to exchange goods for other goods, but rather a world where the dominant economic actors are using the production of goods as a way to acquire money. So that's, that's also a valid reading of Keynes. Many readings of Keynes. In this rest of this lecture, I'm going to focus on one particular model, again, the one that is, is discussed in chapter two of Snowden and Vane's um, modern macroeconomics, although you can find, you know, versions of this model many other places. Um, so the characteristics of this model, first, we do have direct causal links between quantities. We don't have balancing supply and demand um, being balanced by a price adjustment. Here we have a, a, an economic quantity, a change in one economic quantity leading directly to a change in another economic quantity in a sort of one-way causal story. Output is determined by spending. This is the, the sort of principle of effective demand. It means that the, the supply side of the economy, while it exists somewhere in the background, is not playing an important role in the story. The amount that can be produced is, is not really relevant because we assume, at least in the conditions to which the model applies, that businesses have excess capacity, there's unemployed labor. So the amount that can in principle be produced is not, is not really important because what matters is how much will be produced and that depends on how much is being spent in the economy. That's the principle of effective demand. Third, consumption and savings are not the drivers. They're not in the driver's seat anymore. They are residuals. They're passive results of changes in the level of income. And that's, that's sort of the, the core of the Keynesian consumption function. Um, that means, given again that we're imagining an economy that basically consists of households that save and consume and businesses that invest, if households' decisions are basically passive, it means investment is in the driving seat. Variation in output is driven by investment. The future is uncertain. This is not an explicit assumption in the model. It's not really something you can explicitly put into a formal model, but it is implicit in that it underlies the behavior of both investment and the interest rate within the model. Um, the interest rate has a strong effect on investment. This is shared with the classical model, the notion that high interest rates discourage investment, low interest rates encourage investment. The specific mechanism, as I'll, as I'll discuss a bit later, that Keynes imagines for this is different from the classical model, but the, the sort of formal logic of it is, is the same. And finally, and this is another key departure from the classical model, the interest rate in Keynes is determined not in the, in the current model, in the market, but balancing current consumption and current investment, the flow, the flow of those, but the asset market, the market of assets, financial assets versus money. And it reflects not the supply of savings, but the supply of liquidity. The key variable for the interest rate is how much do people want to hold money as, as, as a source of safety, flexibility versus how much are they willing to hold a higher yielding, but less liquid asset like a bond. Um, so this, this is, is, is what drives the interest rate. It's also where one of the ways that uncertainty really comes in at the heart of the story, because the reason you want to hold money is because you don't know what the future is going to hold. So you want to keep your options open. Um, and this is, this is a key departure. It, there's, a, there's a good reason that the full title of the book is the general theory of money, interest, and employment. Keynes's account of money and interest is, is, is absolutely central to the story he's telling. 
That said, in the general theory, the actual picture of financial markets you get is, is, is pretty minimal. You have basically a market where bonds, it's not even clear who's issuing these bonds, but we have bonds that are trading for money where the interest rate is set. And then we have a stock market over, over to one side that's influencing the investment decision. In, in other works like the treatise on money, he had a much you know, richer picture of the financial system. So we can summarize this, I'll, I'll come back to this, but let's just quickly summarize this, this sort of one way causal story. Liquidity preference in combination with this fixed stock of money determine an interest rate. That interest rate in combination with business owners, entrepreneurs beliefs or expectations of the future determine the level of investment. The level of investment determines the level of output via the multiplier. And then the level of output determines the level of employment the level of consumption and the level of savings. So consumption and savings are, 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 are the tail here that are being wagged. They're, they're, they're determined by income. They're not playing any independent role. And employment is also being determined just by the level of output. Nothing that happens over in the labor market is gonna influence the level of employment. That, that side of the story Keynes wavered a bit on, but, but basically we can say the level of employment, particularly the, the wage question was one that he kind of shifted his view on, but the level of employment is determined by the level of output. The reason unemployment is high at a given moment is because not much stuff is being produced. It has nothing to do with anything specifically going on in the labor market. <clears throat> and how much stuff is produced depends on business investment decisions, which depend on, you know, the interest rate is determined in asset markets and these subjective expectations. So it's this one way story that runs this way. So, okay, so now let's go through the separate pieces of this. The principle of effective demand, as I said, says that the level of output, the level of production in the economy is determined by the amount of spending, which you know, assumes that we normally have more capacity. And, and clearly as, as a sort of description of the normal situation in a capitalist economy, this is, this is correct. There's a reason businesses advertise. There's a reason if you, if you look on, you know, you open your browser, the ads you see are for businesses that want you to buy their product. You don't see ads from people who have money looking for something to buy. Um, most businesses, most of the time would like to be selling more than they are. Most businesses, most of the time, their level of output is constrained by their ability to find buyers. There's normally a degree of excess capacity in the economy. Again, we can, we can debate the scope over which this generalization applies, but certainly it is, it is a reasonable, if we're talking about the short run, the normal short run situation in, in, in the kind of economy we live in, it's a reasonable one. Okay, so now income and spending are definitionally equal because everything that we count as spending has to show up as income for somebody. That's just a basic feature of, of the, the way we, we, we do our national accounts. Um, so the actual level of production in the economy will be um, the one where, where the people choose that level of spending given that level of income. You might have a situation where people find that their income is different from what they expected it to be, or perhaps their spending is different from what they expected it to be, and they're trying to change their behavior. And again, in some versions of Keynes, that kind of disequilibrium process is very important. But the, the level that output should eventually settle at or tend towards is one where that level of spending is the right level of spending that people would choose given that level of income. And another way, more or less equivalent way of saying that is, is where people have the income that they expected to have when they made their spending decisions. Now, definitionally at that point, investment will always equal savings. Again, we only have two kinds of output in this economy, investment and consumption. So say consumption is at level C1, investment is at level I1, well, then output will be at level Y1, which is equal to C1 plus I1. And since we've defined savings as output minus consumption, savings will be equal to I1. That might seem like the most trivial piece of algebra that you've, you've, you've seen, but it actually is expressing something quite important. And that is that if, if Y is endogenous, if Y is adjusting, if Y is determined by C and I, then there's no need for anything else to happen to keep savings equal to investment. In particular, there's no need for the interest rate to change. If Y is being determined by C and I, then automatically S will always be equal to I. So once we've allowed Y to be, once we've introduced the principle of effective demand, we've guaranteed that savings will always be equal to investment without any need for any, anything else to happen. For instance, the interest rate to change to bring that about. So, okay, moving on to the next piece of this structure, the consumption function. Um, 
what we say, the idea here, and this is sort of, this is a, another sort of positive claim about how the economy operates, is that household consumption choices, current consumption is strongly dependent on current income. Um, now this is a surprise, this might seem sort of obvious, but it's actually a surprisingly radical view, both when Keynes, you know, expressed it and in the context of today's economics, um, there's a strong view that people's consumption choices should be made independently of their current income. So we've got, you know, the, 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 the conventional view today is some version of the lifetime income or permanent income hypothesis, which essentially says people have some knowledge of their income over the entire future lifetime or in this even stronger versions there and their children's and descendants down, you know, to the end of time. And on the basis of knowing all of those future incomes, they are going to make their consumption choices today that essentially people can move their income around over their lifetimes in order to get a smooth path of consumption that is the, the highest, you know, that they can get over their entire income. So that's, that's the view that Keynes is, is pushing against. Um, so if we start from the assumption, well, you know, if you, and obviously the permanent income hypothesis does define does describe certain situations. There are plenty of cases where somebody loses their job, their income may be transitorily dropped to zero. They don't cut their consumption spending to zero, obviously. They don't even, even if your income drops a lot, you may assume some of that is temporary and you'll keep your higher level of spending on the assumption that your income is going to come back. Or conversely, you know, the classic example, people early in their lives may um, borrow money, let's say for college education, on the assumption that later their income will be higher. And then the notion is that, you know, in the middle of your lifetime, you're spending less than your income because you want to be able to finance consumption spending at the end of your life when you retire. So the permanent income hypothesis is not completely without support. But then we might ask the question coming the other way. So why, why is that not a complete description? Why should there be a link between current income and um, current consumption. And the, the two most commonly given reasons are first, many households are liquidity constrained. You do not have available to you to spend today the income you are going to earn next year or 10 years from now or even next month. People live paycheck to paycheck. This is a reality for many people. Um, you don't have a lot of liquid savings that you can spend down and you don't have any easy access to credit that would allow you to move your future income into, into the present. Now we can debate exactly how many households are liquidity constrained to, to what degree, but certainly some degree of liquidity constraints are real. Um, secondly, people actually don't know what their income is going to be in the future. And so when you are trying to make, if even to the extent that you are in a position to try to you know, spend your future income today, you have to make some guess about what your future income is actually gonna look like. And that is going to depend to some significant extent on, on what your actual income is. Um, the, the, the question, how much can you earn from the kind of work you do? Well, the only real basis you have for, for assessing that is, is how much do you earn from the kind of work you do? So if people have some sustained shift in their income in the present, that's going to change their beliefs about the way their income is likely to be in the future. Um, a third reason I might have included here is that um, a lot of consumption spending is actually sort of linked to the process of, of earning an income. Things that you do like pay for childcare, pay for your commute, or things that you pay for because you're working at a job. And you know, there's a certain amount of, of, of third party consumption that happens through healthcare spending, through other employer provided benefits, um, nonprofit, which is, 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 is just totally linked to, to people's current income. So we could, we could add that as well. Um, if you, you know, lose your job, you will also lose your health benefits and, and that health spending is, 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 is classed as consumption. And, but in any case, some combination of these things, liquidity constraints, um, the fact that expectations are linked to current income, expected income is linked to current income and, and maybe also some, some forms of consumption that are actually part of the income generating process themselves like commuting. Um, for all these reasons, you're, um, we think your consumption is going to be closely linked to uh, to your current income. That's at least the assumption in in this model. So we write that a very simple way of writing that. We can write this equation c equals c zero plus little c y. Um, c zero we're calling autonomous consumption, the consumption that is not linked to current income. And then this little c here um, is what's called the marginal propensity to consume. 
Um, and sometimes you'll see it written out as MPC rather than just a little c. Um, some people, as I do here, write it as just a little c. Notice also that the aggregates are capital letters and this um, very, this, this parameter that applies at, at the, uh, you know, is, is, is a lowercase letter. We, we sort of try to follow that convention where the uppercase letters are economy-wide aggregates. Um, so, uh, so, so that's a very simple equation. And for this to be meaningful, for this to be useful, we're going to assume that C is less than one. If, if the marginal propensity consumed is greater than one, the whole thing kind of goes haywire. If, but if it's close to zero, on the other hand, then this isn't a very useful equation. This is a, a useful equation when, when little c is less than one, but fairly close to it. Um, basically, this is a good way of thinking about consumption only if current income is in fact the main determinant of current uh, consumption spending. <coughs> now, obviously, since saving is just um, income minus consumption, we can just as well write, write the same, you know, the equivalent equation for um, total savings where there's some kind of marginal savings rate um, and that, that tells us what savings is. Consumption is a function of income. Savings is also a function of income. Now, a natural next step would be to change it from, if we're thinking about consumption as something that happens at the level of the household, then we should use disposable income, meaning the income actually received by the household sector. Again, remember that income in a macroeconomic se setting is identically equal to uh, output and expenditure, but not all of that is received by the household sector. So we'd have to subtract taxes. We'd also have to subtract retained earnings, the profits that stay within the corporate sector rather than being paid. Profits that are paid out are of course received as income in the form of dividends by the household sector, but profits that are retained are not. And then we would add transfers, um, unemployment insurance payments, social security payments. Um, but for now we'll stick with just why, we'll, we'll ignore that next wrinkle. All right, so um, that's the consumption side of the, of the story. Now we move back the next step to the investment side. Now, the fundamental story that Keynes is telling about investment is that although entrepreneurs, capitalists are uh, seeking profit, they are doing so under conditions of fundamental uncertainty. They are not able to calculate exactly what the return will be on a project that they might wish to undertake. And this really matters because investment decisions are long lasting and irreversible. Um, if you didn't know the exact return, but you could constantly adjust your choices, it wouldn't really matter because you'd kind of feel your way towards the right choice by trial and error. Um, and your uncertainty about the distant future wouldn't have to be a factor because you're not making, your decisions don't, don't lock you into anything in the distant future. But a lot of investment goods are very long lived. This is this is a true fact about the world. You know, a lot of investment is in structures which last for decades. Um, you know, even even industrial machines typically have a life. You know, measured in in, in you know on the order of ten years. Um, historically, things like railroads are extremely long lived. So, you know, you're you're making a decision where the the income you're going to get from this thing is going to depend on things happening many years from now which is, is, is something that is just hard to know with any, any certainty and, you, and they're irreversible. Once you built a railroad, you cannot you know, melt it down and turn it back into uh, you know, a steel mill instead. The, 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 the value, the labor that went into creating the railroad is embodied in a railroad and nothing else. You can't, you can't get it back. So this, this creates sort of an unavoidable subjective element to investment. Um, one of Keynes's uh, nice expressions of this, he says, Enterprise only pretends to itself to be mainly actuated by the statements in its own prospectus, however candid and sincere. Only a little more than an expedition to the South Pole is it based on an exact calculation of benefits to come. If the animal spirits are dimmed and the spontaneous optimism falters, leaving us to depend on nothing but a mathematical expectation, enterprise will fade and die, though fears of loss may have a basis no more reasonable than hopes of profit had before. And incidentally, that phrase animal spirits you often hear used in the context of, of discussions of stock prices, but Keynes actually uses it here to talk about the motivation of people carrying out real business investment. Um, on the other hand, although there is a subjective element, interest rates do matter. One reason they matter, of course, is because a lot of investment is externally uh, financed. Businesses borrow money to invest. Uh, in fact, it's the main reason they do borrow money. In that case, if we're thinking in that context, then we don't want to think just about interest rates, but also credit conditions, which may matter more. The question for a business, you know, especially a small business, when they're, uh, you know, thinking of, 
undertaking some credit finance expansion is not probably what interest rate will I pay on my loan, but can will a bank give me that loan at all? So we have to think about you know, the terms that lending is done as well as the interest rate. Um, but Keynes' story is actually a little bit different, at least in the general theory, he does not emphasize the external financing side. He emphasizes the effect of interest rates on asset prices. Um, and this is not, again, a financing thing. It's not because he thinks that businesses finance investment by uh, selling stock, which incidentally, they do not. There was a brief period in the 1920s, actually, when in the US there was a fair amount of um, new stock offerings uh, used to finance new investment. And, and certainly during the you know, late 90s, there was a fair amount of that. But historically, businesses do not um, finance investment by issuing stock. The story rather is that high stock prices make investment attractive because they create an easy exit option for, 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 for the business owner, for the founder. So, oops, the formatting's a little messed up here, but you can see the quote. Um, there is an inducement to spend on a new project what may seem an extravagant sum if it can be floated off on the stock exchange at an immediate profit. So this is, this is um, uh, he says, you know, the certain class of investment are governed by the average expectation of those who deal on the stock exchange rather than by the genuine expression, expression, expectations of the professional entrepreneur. In other words, you may have doubts that your, your business is actually going to be successful, but if you can make your investment and then liquidate it, become liquid by selling stock to somebody else who will reliably buy it at a high price, you don't care. So this makes investment very attractive. And again, if we think about you know the the internet bubble, the not late 1990s tech you know tech boom, this is a very a very um, prescient quote. Um, so so this is sort of the story. And, and conversely, when so he says, I don't, I don't know if I believe this one as much. When stock prices are low, businesses don't invest because it's easier to just acquire their competitors. Anyway. The, the, the key takeaway from this is, it, you know, it was formalized <clears throat> by post-war Keynesians the Society of Tobin's Q, which basically says, if you look at the value of a, of a firm's real assets, less its debt, and then compare that to its the market capitalization in the stock market, uh, that tells you, should this firm be investing more or should it be investing less? And the notion is the firms that are highly valued in the stock market should and will invest more, and the firms that are you know, where the stock market sees them as being less valuable than their existing assets should not be investing and in, that this will kind of steer investment. Not a very good description of investment in much of the 20th century, which actually where the stock market probably did not play a central role. Uh, but arguably, you know, the stock market in the last, you know, let's say 30 or 40 years has played a larger role as opposed to, you know, during the period through much of the 20th century. And so maybe something like this story is more applicable. For our store, for our for our purposes, it's interesting to think about. If you're going to write down a model of this, it's enough to say that interest, the interest rate has a negative impact on investment. Investment is a negative function of the interest rate. High interest rates, low investment, low interest rates, high investment. Now, again, we need to have in the back of our minds some idea about the mechanism. And it could be the sort of more straightforward mechanism where if it's expensive to borrow, you will not borrow as much and you will not invest as much or this somewhat more roundabout, but, but you know, maybe also relevant story where low interest rates boost stock prices and high stock prices encourage investment. Anyway, moving on. So, okay, so we've, we've gone from the notion that demand determines output, that's one. Two, um, the part of demand that actually matters is investment. The consumption is, is a function of income. So the part of demand that matters is investment. The investment decision is partly based on this sort of subjective evaluation of an uncertain future, but also is influenced by the interest rate. All right, so what then um, influences the interest rate? Well, um, the first, the, the, and this is, this is again a criti critical piece of this. The idea is the interest rate is a price. Yes, it is a market price. So now we do have a, a price, you know, with, 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 a, with the sort of market market forces that we're used to. But it's not, it's a stock equilibrium in the asset market, not a flow equilibrium in the loanable funds market. A stock, remember, in economics and macroeconomics is, is something that exists in a definite quantity at a definite moment. A flow is something that's happening over time. Saving and investment are flows. They are things that are happening per unit period. The quantity of money, if we believe in such a thing, the quantity of bonds, are stocks. They they just there's just a certain amount of them. 
It's not something that, that happens over time. So this is a stock equilibrium. One thing, it's stocks, stock prices generally, and I don't, I mean this literally, if you're talking about like stocks is in the stock market, more broadly stock prices in general will adjust faster than, than flow prices. Um, they're constant, they don't involve any actual behavior. They're just constantly being revalued in, in market transactions. Whereas a change in a flow requires somebody to actually change their behavior. A change in the flow of investment requires somebody to undertake a new project or halt an existing one. And that's, that's a process that takes time. And there's a whole you know, set of decisions that have to be made and so on. A stock equilibrium can happen very quickly because all it requires is that the same asset be sold at a different price. Um, <clears throat> so the interest rate is determined in a stock equilibrium. It's determined in the market for existing assets, not a, a notional loanable funds market um, balancing saving and investment. That's one. Two, well, okay, um, detail on this. Now, here's the thing. Okay, we're imagining bonds. We're thinking of a, of a market with bonds and money. So remember the bond price and the interest rate always move inversely. If you have a very long bond, um, that, you, that pays a yield, an amount of money every year, Y, the value of that bond is gonna to tend towards Y over R, which is the interest rate. In the extreme case of a perpetuity, a bond that lasts forever, that just pays its yield every year forever, not very common today. Big part of British national debt in the, in the 19th century were perpetuities, not, not so many of them today, but analytically it's a simple, nice thing to think about because for perpetuity, this approximate sign here would be an equal sign. A perpetuity, this is, this is the value of it. A 30 year bond, as, you, as, your, as your maturity of your bond gets longer, as you go from 10 to 20 to 30 years, the value of the bond is gonna appro approach this formula, the, the, the annual yield divided by the interest rate. So, if the prevailing interest rates in the market are 5% and you have a perpetuity that pays you a dollar every year, then the value of that perpetuity is gonna be $20. That's what this says. And a 30 year bond that pays a yield of, of a dollar a year is gonna to, is going to tend toward, it's gonna to be in the vicinity of $30. So that means as the bond, as the interest rate changes, the bond price changes, or conversely, as the bond price changes, the interest rate changes. As one of these items changes, the other, has to change in, 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 um, in proportion because this is not a behavioral equation. This is an accounting identity. This is really, in a sense, what the interest rate means. What the interest rate means is simply the price of a bond relative to its yield. That's actually what an interest rate is. Uh, <clears throat> so if you change the price of the bond, you've changed the interest rates. And then, you know, if at the opposite extreme, if we have something that pays just once a year from now, a payment of Y, then its value will be this. Well, it's a slightly different formula, but again, you can see it has the same property, which is that as, as V goes up, R goes down. As, as R goes up, V goes down. They have to move inversely to each other. So that means that if you think about the market that's determining the price of bonds or the price of other debt instruments, that market is exactly by the same token determining the interest rate. And, and so one of Keynes's big ideas is, is that, that is in fact where the interest rate is determined, not in the market for current, current loans. Um, basically, what you have is a more liquid asset, money, being traded against a less liquid asset, a bond. As people um, want more liquidity, more liquid assets, the price of money is going to go up and the bond is going to go down. If people feel that liquidity is less important, the price of the bond is going to go up and the price of, of money is going to go down. And that, that trade-off money relative to the interest rate. I'm not talking about inflation here, but we're talking about the price of these two assets relative to each other. Um, and that change in the value of the bond, bond V is, is implies an inverse change in the prevailing interest rate. So that's, that is Keynes' story of the interest rate. Um, so liquidity though, this is, this is such a tricky concept and one that people really, really struggle with. But in a general way, we mean flexibility. Sometimes people say shiftability, that's an older term. The, the ability to do many different things with it, to use it for one purpose or, to, or a different purpose. You know, a house you can live in, great. You can rent it and generate some income from it, but that takes some, uh, you know, some time and effort to find a tenant and get them in there and collect the rent and so on. If you wanna do anything else, Possession of the house is not is not super helpful. I mean, yeah, you can host uh, parties or fundraisers or you know, I, I have my kids um, pod uh, meeting some days in the house, so now it's functioning as a schoolroom. It has a little bit of flexibility, but not not um, uh, 
not, not very much. Um, money, you can do anything with. I mean, not literally anything, but our society is organized to kind of maximize the number of things that you can do with money. You can buy a place to live, but you could also buy food. You could buy some kind of services from somebody. You could, of course, buy something that will give you an income in the future. You can buy something that will give you political power if you want to, you know, do buy a newspaper or make a donation to a candidate. You can buy anything with money. It's flexible. So if you want to keep your options open, you want money or something that is liquid. Now, for assets that are not money, we tend to think of liquidity as how easily they can be turned into money, how quickly and reliably you can sell them or borrow against them. Uh, we can also think in a somewhat different way, liquidity is the ability to make payments, expenditures that you didn't plan on making. It, being liquid means keeping your options open. And that's a little, in, in a slightly different sense because that could also mean, for instance, the ability to borrow money on short notice gives you liquidity in that sense. And um, Again, somewhat, but not quite the same is, is the ability to make to the confidence that you will be able to pay the stuff you need to pay when you need to pay it. This is why, you know, people keep cash on hand or they keep businesses keep cash reserves, because if something unexpected happens to your income, you can still make the payments that you're going to need to make. So liquidity combines, and, and that's not an exhaustive list. People certainly use liquidity in, in other senses as well. But for our purposes, that sort of complex of ideas is what we mean by liquidity. So the desire to be more liquid or less liquid depends essentially on um, how uncertain you are on some level about the future. The more confident you are in the future, the less you're gonna worry about flexibility because you know what you're gonna to need to do, the less you're gonna worry about the need to meet unexpected obligations or to make your, your known payments if, if you're, something happens to your income because you're not in very much doubt about those things. So. If you're more confident with the future, liquidity is less important to you. If you're more uncertain, not necessarily pessimistic, but just don't know, you might think some great opportunity is gonna arise. I'm hopeful that I'm gonna have some fantastic opportunity, but I'm not sure what it's gonna be. So I should stay liquid and, and keep money or something that can easily be converted into money so that I can take advantage of that opportunity when it arises. So the story here is this. If liquidity preference increases for whatever reason, if people want more flexibility, if, people, if people's desire to keep their options open increases, then they're going to want to hold relatively more of the liquid asset available to them, which in this, in this simple story, two assets, money and bonds. Money is the more liquid one. So people, the demand shifts towards money and away from bonds. The stock of money, Again, in this story is fixed. The stock of bonds in the short run is also fixed. So the way this high demand for money relative to bonds gets expressed is a fall in the price of bonds relative to money. Since we normally measure prices in money, we can just say a fall in the price of bonds. And a fall in the price of bonds, as I, as I just talked about a couple of minutes ago, is exactly equivalent to a rise in the interest rate. So this is the story of how the interest rate is determined in Keynes. People's shifting liquidity preference leads to shifts in the demand for money versus bonds. That then is expressed in the price of bonds and the price of bonds you know, flipped over is the interest rate. Now, in the general theory, Keynes assumes that we have a fixed exogenously fixed stock of money. So people can't actually increase their, their holdings of money in the aggregate. So everything that has happens in response to changes in liquidity preference uh, takes the form of a change in the price of bonds. We can extend the basic logic of this story to a world without a fixed stock of money where there's many different assets that are money like to different degrees that are liquid to different degrees. The basic story still works. Obviously the details get more complicated, um, but Keynes's version of it and the version, for instance, in, in Snowden and Vane assumes a fixed stock of money. So we can go back here now to this story. We've got, we've got this liquidity preference plus fixed stock of money determining an interest rate. That interest rate then influences investment um, along with the subjective expectations of entrepreneurs. That level of investment determines output via the multiplier Multiplier is something we're gonna come back to. Um, and then as a result of a change in output, we get a change in employment. That's sort of the outcome in, in the general theory. If it's this, the general theory of money, interest, and employment, money and interest are sort of what's driving the story and employment is the outcome that we care about the most. So the general theory of money, interest, and employment is a story about how this stuff is driving this stuff. 
consumption and savings are, are just residuals here. And this is an important piece of the story. Savings doesn't, doesn't play any independent role at all. It's just, it's just something that happens as income goes up and down, savings also goes up and down. But it's not, it's not there's no arrows coming out of S here. It's not doing anything else. Um, so, uh, so this again is, now we could complicate that story a little bit. Again, if, we, if we're gonna um, follow Keynes, the, the effect of the interest rate on investment is not direct but is, is mostly or entirely mediated by changes in asset prices. High interest rate doesn't directly discourage investment so much as it, 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 it leads to a lower value of, of let's say stocks. And then the, the stock market crash is what discourages investment. And this complicates things a little bit. First of all, it gives another important channel for expect, expectations to operate through because for reasons that Keynes talks about and, and we'll come back to later on when we talk about asset bubbles, there's reasons to think that asset prices themselves, the expectations in the asset market, in the stock market are gonna be much more unstable, much more subject to wild swings than the expectations of the entrepreneurs, the business owners who are carrying out investment. Among other things, the business owners carrying out investment are presumably specialists or managers, professional managers. They are specialists in whatever their line of business is. They have some, some particular knowledge of their field that gives them some ability to assess the future. The, the participants in the asset market by and large are, are, are you know, investors who don't have any particular expertise and are just going basing their beliefs about the world on either just sort of random guesses or what everybody else thinks. So, uh, and then of course, the possibility of capital gains here also makes people much more sensitive to, you know, everybody else's opinion. So the fact that the interest rate effect on investment is mediated through asset prices makes for a lot more instability and it makes monetary policy a less reliable tool for, for controlling investment. So if you have this story of Keynes, and this was, you know, in a way, the one that was adopted post-war, it seems quite natural. Okay, we fix the problem by just adjusting M so that employment stays where we want it to go. With this story, that's less reliable because this thing is just throwing all sorts of, of noise into the process. All right, so that's that's the basic Keynes story. Now, let me just bring out a couple of pieces of that that I think need a little, a little extra emphasis or a little extra explanation or development. Uh, one is, is the role of savings in the Keynes model because this, I think today, is, is an area where you really, you really still do see a sharp conflict between people who really have kind of imbibed the Keynesian vision versus people who may in many ways have a kind of Keynesian view of policy, but are still kind of mentally living in a classical world. Um, and the, the sort of the key, the key thing from the Keynes story here is that savings is residual. Savings is an after the fact number that we write down. Savings is never an independent factor in anything that happens in the world. Savings is not something that people choose. It's not something that people do. It's not something that goes up or down on its own. It's not something that does anything. It's just after you've, you've figured out everything else that's happening in the economy, after you figured out what income is and investment, then you can say, oh, also we can write down this other number savings, but it's not, it's not, a, it's not a causal factor. So that's, you know, that's, that's a sort of central, central part of the Keynesian vision. So again, let's, let's think about what, what, why that is and what that means. Well, first of all, households are making choices. The choice a household makes is to consume more or to consume less. The, the decision they make is, is to buy things or not to buy things. Now you might say, well, savings is the difference between income and consumption. So if you choose your level of consumption, then you've also chosen your level of savings. So at the level of the individual household, it might seem silly to say households are choosing consumption, but they're not choosing savings. But the thing is, savings um, also depends on income. Households do not choose income. Now, again, at the level of the individual household, that doesn't matter because you can treat your income as, as given. But in the aggregate, income is being determined by the same process within which households are choosing their consumption. So you don't really, you don't have a choice between consumption and savings because your consumption choice is going to determine, the aggregate consumption choice determines what income is. So there's not an, in, there's not a choice between consumption and savings. In this case, there's a choice between consumption, which then also influences income at the aggregate level. In other words, you could say at the individual level, income is given and then you're jointly choosing consumption and savings. But at the aggregate level, it's savings that's given and households choices jointly determine consumption and income. Um, 
Aggregate spending is what determines aggregate income. In a closed economy, when people reduce their consumption, they, that just leads to a fall in total income and there is no effect on savings. And therefore there's no, there's no link from savings to investment. Savings does not in any way cause investment. People make choices about consumption, those choices in consumption then are gonna affect aggregate income. Savings just is what it is. Now it's possible that indirectly a choice of lower consumption might in the end lead to higher investment, but you'd need something else in the story. It's not gonna happen via the savings rate, but it might happen for instance, if you have a central bank that reduces interest rate when they see income output Y falling, they, they, rate, they lower interest rates and that encourages investment. On the other hand, it could all just as easily go the other way. If businesses are making choices about their investment level based on what their current sales are, households consuming less could reduce investment. The key point here is that there's no need for any prior change in savings before investment changes because any change in investment is automatically going to generate the required savings. Any change in investment automatically generates a change in savings. Savings just is whatever investment is. That's again, a central feature of this model. Um, so we can see as a matter, you know, think about how this sort of plays out in practice. Imagine a firm spends a hundred of, you know, dollars or whatever, hiring workers for a new investment project. Well, that creates income for those workers, a hundred dollars of income in this, in this scenario. So let's say then the workers consume $70 of that income and save $30. The $70 that the workers spend now is income for somebody else, for whoever produced the goods that they bought. Let's say the people who produce those goods consume $50, save $20. Now we've got $50 of incomes for other uh, consumer goods. And you see we've added $50 of savings so far and this remaining income is still circulating. And this process is just going to continue until there's a full hundred dollars of new savings. And that's going to be true at every moment along the way. At the first instant, after the firm laid out this hundred dollars, the workers have not spent any of it. So at that first instant, the workers have saved that full hundred dollars. Savings by the workers has gone up exactly as much as the amount of investment. Then as the workers start consuming that, their savings goes down, but the savings of other people in the economy goes up. But the total amount of new savings created in this process is always going to exactly equal the investment at the start of it. That's, that's going to happen just automatically and mechanically um, as a result of the, uh, of the investment decision. So there is no point in this process where there ever is even the possibility of a shortfall of savings. So uh, as Keynes put it um, in, in his um, article, The General Theory of Employment, which he wrote um, in response to another the general theory, the book, when it came out, um, you know, generated an enormous reaction immediately. And um, so he wrote this article the next year, 1937, in response to a number of the more prominent critics. And that actually really clarifies, this 1937 article clarifies some important pieces of, of the general theory. So this, in, in that article, among other things, he says, um, there will always be exactly enough ex post savings to take up the ex post investment. Ex post here meaning, what actually happens as opposed to what people intended or expected to happen. If you get, you may not have planned to save any money, but if your income unexpectedly is higher than you had planned on, then your ex post saving will also be higher. So there will always be exactly enough ex post saving to take up the ex post investment and so release the finance which the latter had been previously employing. The investment market can become congested through shortage of cash. It can never become congested through shortage of saving. This is the most fundamental of my conclusions within this field. There may be a problem with firms financing investment because they may be dependent on bank loans, for instance, but there's never a, a shortage of saving. Um, if, there's, if there's something constraining the ability of businesses to invest on that side, it's, it's a financial issue. It's not an issue with the, the amount of saving in the economy. All right, so that's saving. Passive residual, never, never making anything happen. Um, wages in the Keynes model. This is, this is the issue where um, Keynes actually, the, the one thing that he really, um, after he, he published the general theory and, and various reactions to it, this is the one, one piece he said I got wrong, which is a little unfortunate because it's literally the first substantive claim in the book um, is the one he says is, is the one major error in the book. But anyway, um, he says in, in the general theory, he says that he is maintaining the first classical postulate that the wage equals the marginal product while rejecting the second classical postulate that wage equals marginal disutility of labor. 
In other words, in terms of the classical model, he's assuming that, that wages and employment are falling on the labor demand curve, that, that businesses are hiring workers just up to the point where the marginal product of the last worker hired is just equal to the going wage. But he's saying the wage typically falls above the labor supply curve. Workers would like to supply more labor at the going wage. That's, that's what it means for there to be involuntary unemployment. Now, he later said this was a mistake. He said that if I could go back and revise one thing in the book, this would be the thing I would change. Um, uh, so, and I should add an, another element of this, this story is that the marginal product declines with output. That's the only way you really get that story. Um, and so part of what was, you know, so part of the problem here is the assumption that we have a perfectly competitive labor market where, you know, firms are obliged to, to, to hire at a, at a marginal product. The other, but the other problem is the assumption of declining marginal product. If there isn't a declining marginal product, then the next, you know, the, the out product of the next worker is the same as the product of the last worker. So you can't, um, uh, this this story doesn't work. If firms hire out until wage equals marginal product, they'll they'll hire either no workers or an infinite number of workers. So you need a different story at that point. So um, in our Keynes model, we are going with you know the the later Keynes and not not the Keynes of the general theory on this point. So we're thinking that the the wage falls somewhere between those two curves. It's it's higher than it's above the the, the labor supply curve meaning the wage is higher than, than the minimum that workers would accept to do that much work, which again is what it means to say there's unemployment. There are people who would like to work at the going wage and can't find work, but it's lower than the demand curve for work, for the, 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 the marginal product of labor. It's lower than the marginal product of labor. So it's somewhere in between those curves, which means in practice wages are determined by, you know, some mix of convention and bargaining power, history, institutions. Um, you know, basically in a lot of cases, realistically, um, wages are set with reference to how wages for that sort of job have been set in the past. I think a broader point is that our sort of classical neoclassical vision assumes that everything is constantly being renegotiated based on fundamentals. Real economies are really um, difficult and complex coordination problems where you'd never be able to get anywhere if you had to start fresh every day. And so you do things on the basis of how, how they've been done in the past. And that certainly applies to wage setting. Uh, which means in a sense that our supply and demand, labor supply and demand curves don't matter since, since the actual outcome is not on either one of those curves. At, at most we could imagine them as setting some sort of boundaries beyond which our, our conventional wage setting process is not gonna be able to go. But even those boundaries, we don't know how close they are, or how, 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 how fixed they are. Now, Keynes does believe that wages are sticky, that they don't change very easily. But in this, a lot of the sort of post-war idea of Keynesianism, like you may have seen that silly video where Hayek and Keynes are rapping at each other and, and Keynes is you know, making the case for sticky wages. That, that is not part of the Keynes model at all. Keynes does believe that wages are sticky, but that is not the source of the, 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 of the problems that he's describing. It's not the reason that we have the possibility of unemployment. In fact, he's very clear that a world with flexible wages unemployment would be much worse. Um, uh, and and um, first of all, prices are set relative to wages. Prices are set as a markup over, over marginal cost. That's a pretty standard theory. And marginal costs are mostly labor. So if you cut wages, you just cut costs, you get deflation, but you don't make, uh, you don't do anything to encourage more hiring. Second, you can't cut wages across the board all at once. When you're talking about wage cuts, wage flexibility, it's always wage flexibility for somebody in particular. And when your wages get cut in particular, you're not, it's not just a question of reducing wages across the board, it's reducing wages for the kind of work you do versus the kind of work somebody else does. So you can't just have a sort of general policy of wage flexibility. Anytime you try to move in the direction of wage flexibility, you're asking somebody in particular to take a pay cut and that's gonna be extremely socially disruptive, something that Keynes writing in the thirties was very conscious about that, you know, the, the, the attack on miners in particular, you know, the idea, oh, well, you know, the problem with the, you know, coal mining industry is just wages are too high. And if wages can come back down, employment can go back up in the mines. But, you know, if you're asking, or especially, you know, the return to the gold standard, well, British prices in general are too high for the old 
pound to gold exchange rate. If we're going to get back to the old level of the pound in terms of gold, we have to bring down prices across the board. But as Kane says, you don't bring down prices across the board. You bring down wages in this industry, wages in that industry, wages in this industry. And as you're doing that, somebody is always taking the hit right now. And they're going to resist that even if in the abstract, reducing wages for everybody across the board would actually have benefits that's not going to be any consolation to the particular group of people who are being asked to take a wage cut now. So, you know, looking at the huge minor strikes that had happened in Britain in the, in the recent past, he, he felt like this is, even if this was economically valid, it's, 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 it's politically far too disruptive. And then finally, employment is not being set in the labor market anyway. So lower wages are not going to um, create an inducement for investment. If anything, they might you know, have the opposite effect if they discourage consumption spending and, you know, businesses are, are, are stuck with even more unused capacity and losses. So it's not going to have any benefits for demand, even if you could somehow do it. So although he did think wages were flat, were, were relatively sticky, he, he, he saw that as, a, as not the reason you had unemployment and instability, but, but a reason why unemployment and instability were not even worse. And it's worth noting in this context, you know, people talk about sticky wages. Wages fell a lot in the Great Depression. One thing you absolutely cannot say about the US or other advanced countries in the 1930s is that wages were, were, were not falling. Wages fell a lot during that period. So it's, it's very odd in retrospect that post-war economists sort of zeroed in on sticky wages as being the source of, of these sort of Keynesian problems. Which brings us to the final thing I wanna bring, talk about, which is that some people looking at Keynes say, you know, there's a lot of insight here. There's a lot of ideas that were really valuable and important. But there's also something that's historically specific to the context that he was writing in the context of the Great Depression. And that some of his insights, which were completely valid and, and, and extremely helpful in a policy context in that context, do not necessarily carry over to other contexts. So we should at least sort of ask, to what extent could the sort of Keynes model be a model specifically of a depressed economy as opposed to a general theory of capitalist economies in general? So first of all, the obvious one, we started with the principle of effective demand, the notion that there's large excess capacity, excess labor, and that, that output is limited by expenditure. In that's obviously going to be true of a depressed economy, sort of, sort of almost by definition, a depressed economy is one where, where there's a lot of capacity that's not being used. Um, but we might wonder if outside of the context of the depression, supply constraints are actually more important. And certainly the mainstream idea, you know, um, through most of the post-war period and, and to an only slightly lesser extent um, up to the present has been exactly this. The, the Keynesian story applies in a depression or deep recession, but the capitalist economies are normally operating relatively close to supply constraints so that under normal conditions, increasing spending will not um, significantly boost output or employment. And Keynes, you know, to be clear, is, is perfectly fine with that idea and says this could happen. You know, you could, you could reach supply constraints and then more spending would no longer, the, the principle of effective demand would no longer be operative. But he tends to assume in the general theory, he doesn't assume, he says very explicitly, he thinks that modern capitalist economies are almost always in a sort of semi-depressed state and that, that a real full, full employment situation would be all extremely rare. So that, but that's, that's obviously a, a question we would have in interpreting this is that how is it, you know, first of all, you know, is the normal situation of modern capitalist economies something like full employment or are they in fact very often in a sort of semi-depressed state? And secondly, is full employment kind of a hard barrier or can, does, does supply actually kind of flexibly respond to, to, to demand so that even, even in a situation that's currently something like full employment, if you, the principle of effective demand can still operate because you can, you know, bring more people into the labor force and so on. So that's, that's, that's a question. It's a question, but obviously the more, the more we think supply constraints are often going to be important, the more we're going to see Keynes's story as a, as a depression specific story. Um, second, we might think that the, the, the Keynesian consumption function is sort of specific to depression circumstances because most households are not normally living hand to mouth. Most households, this would be the argument, normally have significant um, 
financial reserves and have significant ability to borrow so that there's no particular reason under normal circumstances that your consumption decision should be particularly linked to your um, current income. And, and I could add to this similarly, in a situation of the depression where, where demand had fallen so far short for so long, people might really become more pessimistic about their future prospects. You might argue that in the normal recession, the fallen income is not deep enough or lasting enough for people to really change their views about what their income is gonna be in 10 or 20 years. People assume recessions are transitory. That's, that's our understanding of a business cycle. So your, your expectation of your long-term income should not be uh, affected by the fact that you lost your job today. Now, again, I'm not saying this is correct. I'm saying it is a view that people hold and a sort of superficially plausible view. So if we think that households have significant financial reserves, significant ability to borrow, and I should add here, lots of households obviously have no financial reserves and no um, ability to borrow. But if we're talking about macroeconomics and we're talking about the household sector in the aggregate, we're looking at household, we're interested in household consumption in the aggregate, which is mostly at the, at the upper end of the income distribution. So even if most households have limited financial reserves, it could still be true that household consumption in the aggregate is not particularly linked to income because the households that do most of the consuming do have financial reserves. So if you believe something like this, then you think the marginal propensity to consume is gonna be small, maybe close to zero. The multiplier is gonna be small. The consumption function is not a very useful tool. And at this point, you have less of a, less of a you know, reaction of output to current expenditure. And then we might also think that normally monetary policy can fully offset changes to liquidity preference or MEC, marginal efficiency of capital. I should have introduced this term earlier. That's Keynes's term for the beliefs of investors about the, the return on their investment. The marginal efficiency of capital is the entrepreneur's belief about what the, the return on that investment is gonna be. He's, he's very clear about this. It's not an actual fact about the world. The fact about the world doesn't exist, but investors have some idea when they lay out $100 in investment goods, is that gonna generate a 5% return, a 10% return, a 20% return? That belief is the marginal efficiency of capital. So, okay. so we might believe that normally monetary policy changes in M or equivalent can offset whatever's going on with liquidity preference of the marginal efficiency of capital so that we don't need to worry about all that, you know, we don't need to worry about all that stuff um, going on, you know, with 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 liquidity preference expectations, even asset prices. If we can move M enough, we can we can just offset all this other stuff by by just stabilizing using this lever back here. And if, if the central bank can do that, then once you've got a well-functioning central bank, you can ignore this whole part. In fact, if the central bank has a good good enough rule that can keep output near potential then effectively we'll have output determined on the supply side. This is again, a, a, a sort of the dominant post-war Keynesian view. Yes, this story is, is correct in principle, but because we have a central bank that can um, effectively offset all of these influences and can keep output near potential almost all of the time, in effect, output is being determined on the supply side. So if you believe that, so then you might say, well, the special thing about the depression was either one, central banks didn't know what they were doing and made bad choices, or two, had not yet developed the appropriate tools for monetary control of the economy. And so all the demand side forces were not offset by, uh, by monetary policy. And therefore you actually did have output determined on the, on the, on the um, demand side. So, you know, a, a great example of, of, of this kind of thinking is, is Paul Krugman. You know, he's got a book called Return of Depression Economics. Um, there have been a couple versions of it. And he really explicitly says, you know, Keynes, the general theory is depression economics. We could safely ignore it for a long time, but now that our economy is back in something that looks more like a depression, now we need to dust Keynes off and take him off the shelf again. That's, that's one view. There's obviously other perspectives that say that no, that, that the application of the general theory really is, is, is a general one. And I'll stop there.